since 1993, which is a long time. They've been great to me. They gave me these sticks back then, and I still have them. It's my one pair. I haven't broken them yet. I guess I should man up. Um, I think if I stay with them long enough, I'll get, they'll give me another pair. So that's what they're telling me. The acoustics are great. I used them on uh, when we did this, uh, when MTV still played videos. They had a show that was called Unplugged, and we did a, a gig, and I think these were new then. A prototype. And I used them, and they're great. They get a little more crack, and they don't fall apart as much. They're kind of in between us. A wood dowel acoustic stick and a real stick. Because I'm really confused, conflicted in life. I can't make up my mind, and these are perfect for me. These ones are made of wood. They burn great in the fire. You run out of, you know, royalties, which no artists are getting anymore. The nude finish, great idea. I used to have the guy sand them down. Who didn't? And so when you sweat, because you rock so hard, look it, doesn't go anywhere. Old one, gone. Let's try that again. Right there, nude finish, sweaty, huh? Not going anywhere, huh? Old finish, slick, boom. History. So that's, that's, that's a great deal. I don't know what took them so long to do it. And it's probably actually cheaper to make them that way. I don't know, is it? Don't have to varnish them? It's probably just a scam. Don't even do it, don't buy it. Fuck. Started playing drums when I was really little probably five, my grandfather had a band called the Cross Cats, and uh, I'd go to their rehearsals every Wednesday and uh, get up and play the drums in between, and when I was nine, their drummer retired and <laughs> asked me to play. And uh, so I'd, I joined that band when I was nine, and we'd kind of travel around and play uh, old standards and square dances and all sorts of stuff, parties. And um, then I became a rock dude, the band started in 87, and uh, I met Jerry when we got together and listened to some of his, his little demos he had on a forward track, and, and uh, I called my buddy Mike Starr, and he came down, and, and Lane, we, we were all kind of like drifter, homelessy kind of guys, and we uh, were living in this big Lane and Jerry were living in this big rehearsal place that had uh, 50 band rooms with bands open 24 hours and they were kind of had to shifts, you know, to stay there. They could had the keys and they'd let bands in the rooms and uh, we really wanted Lane to join the band, but he had this other band going on and, and uh, he'd jam with us, but we, you know, he just wouldn't commit when we started getting more serious about uh, trying to be a band, you know. and, and uh, so we, we had this idea to purposely start auditioning the shittiest singers we could find. I mean, one guy was even a male stripper. It was, he had like orange hair and looked like the Cowardly Lion. And uh, that was the, finally the, the breaking point. You know, that guy came in and was singing and Lane walked in and he's like, Get, I'm joining, you can't, I can't let you do that. And then the uh, rest is history, you know, somebody discovered that Seattle, Washington existed and, and all the music that was going on up there. We were kind of around before that, all took off. I remember being in uh, Europe and stuff on facelift in like 90, 89, and, and uh, there was little pods of people all over the world like, oh, the Seattle sound, you know, sub pop, and they knew about the bands, but it hadn't turned into, they hadn't invented the word grunge, you know, a media a journalist hadn't invented that yet. And then as we were doing our second record, Dirt, by the time that was kind of coming out, uh, grunge had been invented and everything got weird. And nowadays it's really nice after all this we've gone against and all that's happened and losing such a amazing talent and our friend that uh, a lot of people came along and the music lasted all these years. Like radio didn't leave it and even though we didn't want anything to do with it and, and uh, didn't go out there and try to make that happen. That's something that a record company or uh, people like that can't do unless you're actively working it. They can't make that happen. So that's actually people on their own discovering music and passing it along and radio kept playing it all over. And, uh, so it's nice now, you know, the, the audiences are so different. You got 50 year olds, 13 year olds going to the show, which is cool. You know. it, it was a tough thing to do. I mean, <laughs> we've all felt like we got burned by some comeback move, you know, it's like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. And so when we went into even thinking about recording the record, you know, we just funded it ourselves just to see, as we got to that point, like, oh, let's see how it sounds and see if we even have anything. So we went 
be tied down to like this has you know you have a deal and it has to come out so we we did all we did all the work ourselves and after as the record was finished and we decided that you know should we release it yeah we all did it so do you really want to do this you know take all the crap that's going to come with, with it all these people asking all these questions that you didn't you know purposely didn't want to talk about for a decade or more and uh, we felt like it was time to do that. This has been a tremendous challenge and I'm really proud of all of us for taking it on and, and for people to support it and come along with it and give it a chance and that, that makes me feel good. That's actually, you know, a big reason for doing it and to bring the music that we created with from our past with Lane and everything into the future and, and uh, keep that alive is a really important thing. Like I said, you know, it's not once in a while, you, I remember at the beginning of doing it, people were like, it's a cash grab. It's like, there's no money in the music industry too much anymore, man. If it's a cash grab, then why am I writing checks? You know, I mean, you self-funded the whole thing. So it's it's nice to see that people are coming along with it. And that's that's really important because it's always the same thing. You know, we just are doing what we like to do, make music, we're friends, doing it together. That was part of the allure of doing this is to see how it works nowadays. You know, we've been out of it last when we last did it. People still bought our albums. It was a different infrastructure, and, and uh, it was part of the challenge. You know, and you find that at first it was pretty shocking. You know, like when uh, the albums always leak before they come out, and, and uh, you find out you know hundreds of thousands of people stole the record before it even came out. <laughs> You're like, hey. And then you start having these conversations nowadays too with record labels as we partnered up with EMI, who's been great to us. Um, they, you know, if you guys do this, it might transfer into 2,000 album sales, you know? We're <laughs> That's uh, exactly how it works nowadays. They worry about those kind of things instead of, you know, if you do this, you could sell an extra quarter million albums. Like, you know, sell 2,000 albums. But uh, it's really about the touring and just, we do, you do it for the same reason, you know, the love of, uh, Music. I, I feel like I'm talking to a lot of the newer bands, and I think the days of Cribs and all that are pretty much behind us. You know, it's talking to some guys that you know are today's sort of rock stars, and they don't own a house. You know, they tour for a year and a half, and they go home. And if they're not right in trying to make a record, they have to get a job or have roommates. You know, I mean, you'll talk to other kids, and they're like, "It's okay. You know, the music should be free, and you make all your money touring and T-shirts." But it costs a lot to tour, and and t-shirts, you know, you're not making yourself, there's another company involved, so we're trying to find how we can operate in a way where we're not, where we're comfortable, you know, we're not really going to start tweeting or anything, so. I'm at the airport getting on an airplane. I had a sandwich. I don't know, it's not really. <laughs> I kind of, I, li I like the old days of rock when you really thought like uh, Jimmy Page lived in a haunted castle, so, you know, he didn't. You know, but I mean, you wanted the, the myth of rock, you know, and I think that's kind of been destroyed by the fact that the only way a lot of the times you can get anybody to pay attention to you is to constantly be in their face by giving them so much access to what you do. I mean, at the end of the day, you're just like everybody else. You're just a guy that makes music, you know, and it's really not as interesting as <laughs> one would think, I think, you know, it's like I'd, I'd rather keep my mystery, you know, Marilyn Manson's a monster, you know, his name's Brian, I hear, you know, I mean, the guys in KISS, when I was in KISS Army, I didn't want to know that they were, you know, just normal guys, I wanted to believe that they were those from space, a demon, and then you grow up, you find out they're not, you get bummed out. I gotta start it over. This on? Let's get get it together. <laughs>